Excuse me. Yes. Do you do tattoos? Yes, I do do tattoos. What tattoos do you do? Well, there are two tattoos that I do do. <laughs> the two tattoos that I do... Hang on a minute. You sound like the two Ronnies here. Start again. I was thinking of getting a tattoo. you come to the right place. Now, this is our most popular one. Yeah. Yeah. Or if you want to spend a bit more money... Um, no. Well, how about this? I can tattoo an English-Spanish dictionary <laughs> onto your entire body. What's the point of that? Well, if you want a cup of tea in Spain, you just take your trousers down. <laughs> Mind you, don't order a Battenberg or you get deported. <laughs> How about this? <laughs> I can tattoo an entire suit onto your naked body. <laughs> Jacket, shirt, trousers. What about the underpants? Oh, we'd have to make your own arrangements. No, I'm not keen on that. Of course, some people like the idea of a tattoo, mm. but they think they might get sick of it. So it's best to spend a couple of weeks thinking about one that you really want and then get it tattooed on your next-door neighbour. <laughs> that way you can see it whenever you like. And if you get fed up with it... Just move out. <laughs> no, I don't want any of those. What do you want? Well, I'm involved in amateur dramatics and in our next production I'm playing the part of a punk. Oh, I see. So I want... I am the Antichrist and I want it tattooed on my face. <laughs> you do realise a tattoo is permanent. You won't be able to get it off. Oh, that's all right. It'll come in handy. Why is that? I'm a property developer. <laughs> Going on. We're police officers. We've got to walk the search place. Well, what do you want? We're looking for your husband, Mrs Newman. Frank's not here. He wouldn't be so stupid. You take upstairs. Oh, look, why can't you just leave me alone? You've already turned this place over twice. Mrs Newman, your Frank was sprung from Wandsworth Nick three weeks ago. I have reason to believe he is somewhere in this house. I tell you, he's not here. Look, we've split up. My new bloke's upstairs. Now, I'd hardly be carrying on with him if Frank was in the house. What's through here? Look, I'm telling you, you're wasting your time. He's not here. You've got no right. This is harassment. That's what it is. <laughs> I see you have a dog, Mrs Newman. Yes, that's Snowy. <laughs> As you can see, my husband's not here, Inspector, so if you wouldn't mind... Does Snowy get up to any tricks, Mrs Newman? Chasing cars, running after sticks, that sort of thing? Well, does a few tricks, but I don't Maybe think... Maybe he'll do a couple of tricks for me. Snowy. <laughs> <laughs> Good boy. Play dead, Snowy. <laughs> Good boy. Big for a chalk drop, Snowy. <laughs> Good boy. Roll over, Snowy. <laughs> Aren't you a good boy? Now phone me a taxi. <laughs> <laughs> now that's what I call a clever dog. He didn't even bother looking up the number. Frank, you bloody idiot. Constable, arrest that dog. <laughs> ah, stick a bone in it. <laughs> what the hell's going on? They've arrested Frank. Thank God for that. What do you mean? He wanted to sleep up on the bed every night. <laughs> Marvellous. <laughs> like a lot of people, I have this terrible fear about old age. Obviously, I want to live as long as I can. I just don't want to end up in some old people's home, dribbling down my cardigan, while a nurse wipes me ass with a J-cloth. <laughs> <laughs> it's not an unreasonable ambition, is it? <laughs> old people are treated very badly. But I often wonder how old people were treated 300 years ago. <laughs> but there's no way I'd know, so I asked a question in the first place. <laughs> Waste of time, innit? Of course, nowadays, if you get an incurable illness, you can have yourself frozen, and then they can thaw you out when they find a cure. My uncle wanted to be frozen, but he didn't have any money, so we did it on the cheap. At the first sign of a cough, we took him down to B-jams and bunged him in with the oven chips. <laughs> it's handy, 
You can go down and visit him and pick up a couple of cod steaks at the same time. <laughs> my father's still up and about. He's very lively. My father used to be a memory man. He was a memory man on the music halls for 35 years. When I was seven, he sat me down. He said, son, what's the difference between a memory man and an undertaker? I said, I don't know. He said, well, a memory man remembers convoluted facts from the rear of his cranium... <laughs> and an undertaker buries people. <laughs> Do you know, I've never forgotten that. <laughs> of course, there was an intense rivalry between the memory men and the conjurers. They'd meet up every year, August Bank Holiday, Brighton. The memory men would go down on the coach, singing, drinking, chanting their way through the population of China in alphabetical <laughs> order. <laughs> the conjurers would be down on the seafront causing trouble forcing people against their will at knife point to pick a card, look at it and put it back again. <laughs> One year they got completely drunk. They levitated a deck chair attendant 200 feet up in the air and left him. <laughs> he died after three weeks. He'd have died sooner if some old woman hadn't been catapulting meat pies up in every <laughs> People can be cruel. A friend of mine's just gone to visit his father in hospital. His father said, when I go, everything I've got is coming to you. And he's got an hereditary disease. <laughs> His father held up the medical notes. He said, take a good look at this, son, because one day all this is going to be yours. Hello, Tom. Hello, Colin. I heard you were moved up the E-wing this morning. Yeah, the governor thought I could do with a nice change, so he put me in charge of the maximum security wing. Good crossword, is it? Not bad. I'm stuck on the last clue. What is it? Convict, five letters. So what's the problem? I've put in bastard, but it doesn't fit. <laughs> You're late for tea, aren't you? I know I'm late for tea. This morning, I had the contents of a full chamber pot emptied over my head. Which prisoner did that? Prisoner, it was the wife. <laughs> Forgot her birthday again. Yeah, you can't see any of it left in my head. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm buying your comb. No, no, it's fine, honestly. So how's things on Ewing? All right, you've been busy down here? Fairly. I've been keeping an eye on Rawlins. Well, what's he been up to? Well, you know he controls the supply of illegal tobacco in this prison. Yeah, they say you can't have a smoke without his say-so. I reckon he's taking liberties. What do you mean? He's opened up a kiosk. <laughs> you all right, Smithy? Yeah. Why does he wear his cap like that? Well, you see the way the peak comes right down over his eyes? Yeah. Well, behind that peak is a little cinema screen. <laughs> And when he gets bored, he puts on a film. How do you know that, then? Well, I put on the wrong hat one morning and watched ten minutes of Mary Poppins. <laughs> so that's why he's so quiet. Oh, yeah. Mind you, he gets into trouble occasionally. He had gone with the wind on the other day and he had to see the governor. The governor said you're being transferred to the scrubs and his hat said, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. <laughs> I see Pendry's back working in the kitchen block again. He must be up for parole soon. I think he's already sport his chances of that. He keeps asking for conjugal visits. What's wrong with that? He wants them with Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't had an escape for a long while. Well, there was that bloke last year. Keeble, was it? The one that was in for armed robbery. He overpowered a prison officer and stole his uniform. So what happened? Oh, he's in charge of D-Wing now. He's one of the best officers we've got. <laughs> Do you remember McGuinness? McGuinness. You know, Pee Wee McGuinness. Funny sort of bloke. He escaped by disguising himself as a cloud. <laughs> Cumulo Nimbus, I think it was. <laughs> Slipped out of his cell window, hovered over the PE block for half an hour, and then rose to a height of 15,000 feet. <laughs> it's quite clever, really. What happened to him? He was hit by a plane. <laughs> Mind you, you got to hand it to him. He only had a pair of sheets and a bicycle pump. <laughs> oh, is that the time already? <laughs> yeah, is he all right? Yeah, he's all right. Lassie's just come home. <laughs> it didn't always work here. I used to be a professional footballer. Well, semi-professional. I played for this team. One year, we got through to the third round of the FA Cup. We played Liverpool at Liverpool. They had ten internationals in their team, but our lad still got a result. We lost 8-0. <laughs> Morning. Morning. Here's my pools. Thought I'd put on a fiver this week. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Goodbye.
Arsenal versus Crystal Palace, score draw. <laughs> I don't know why people bother doing the pulls. You've got very little chance of winning. You've got more chance of trying to push an octopus for a Venetian blind. <laughs> and you know what that's like. <laughs> Mind you, if I won the pulls, I'd play elaborate practical jokes and film them. I'd go round to Jeremy Beadle's house, disguised as a mad axeman, <laughs> just for a laugh, <laughs> and then kill him. <laughs> and then I'd get all the bits and hide them all around the country, and I'd send Annika Rice up in a helicopter to look for them. <laughs> and the programme would be called Beadle's About. <laughs> to see me, sir. Yes, Watson. Watson, on your last flying mission, you claim to have brought down eight Messerschmitts, nine Heinkels, and a Junkers 88. That's a very impressive tally. Must have been my lucky day, sir. And you claim to have brought down all these planes in this area here, just south of Maidstone. Yes, sir. <laughs> Would you be surprised to learn, Watson, that we have searched the entire area and we can find no traces of your supposed Messerschmitts, Heinkels, or Junkers 88? I can't understand it, sir. However, we did find the wreckage of 18 of our own Spitfires. <laughs> Do you have an explanation for this? Sir, you have no idea what it's like up there. You're lost in the clouds, your instruments are gone, navigators being wounded. It's hell, sir. And then suddenly a gap opens up in the clouds and planes are coming at you out of the sun. You're blinded, sir. You, you can't see, but you have to make an instant snap decision. You don't know if it's the enemy, but you can't take a chance. You, you can't wait till you're sure. These Spitfires are on the ground. <laughs> they were stationed at RAF Coombe Regis. They were being washed when you appeared out of nowhere and bombed the entire squadron. <laughs> I can't stand RAF Coombe Regis, sir. They're a bunch of snobs. Yes, I know they're a bunch of snobs, but there's a war on. <laughs> Up till now, the name of Four Bombs Watson has been an inspiration to the rest of the men. So why this? The fact is, sir, I... I've lost my nerve. Let me tell you something about nerve, Watson. <laughs> Many years ago, there was a king of Sweden. He was about to lead his troops into a battle when his horse fell lame. The Bishop of Stockholm bravely volunteered to be the king's horse. <laughs> that took nerve. And so the king saddled up the bishop <laughs> and rode towards the enemy, lance in one hand, sabre in the other. And what happened, sir? He was run over by a tank. <laughs> but the point is, Watson, you've got to pull yourself together and get back to the business of winning this war. The truth of the matter is, sir, I've lost my lucky scarf. What happened to it? I lent it to Cooper, sir. He was shot down over Berlin last night. I'm afraid he didn't make it. Doesn't sound like much of a lucky scarf to me. <laughs> oh, I don't know, sir. I'm still here. <laughs> I can't let this go. You understand that, don't you? Come in. What is it? I've just received a message from Downing Street, sir. The war's over. We've won. Good. That's very good. All right. Follow me, Watson. Are you going to court martial me, sir? No, we're going to bomb those snobs at Coombe Regis. <laughs> uh, I live opposite Brixton Prison, and someone, I don't know who, has dug a tunnel from E Wing to the back of my fridge. <laughs> I can't sleep at night. Dozens of prisoners jumping out my fridge all hours of the night. <laughs> Half of them want mini cabs. <laughs> I got one of those keep fit videos at home. Shape up and dance with Pope John Paul. <laughs> <laughs> this one's called the assassination attempt. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good bit of mime, isn't it? I spent five years studying with Marcel Marceau. Unfortunately, at the time he was teaching metal work. <laughs> this one's called Where Are My Welding Gloves? <laughs> next door to me is a keep fit fanatic when he was a teenager he bought a young buffalo 
and every day he used to practice lifting it up. <laughs> By the time this buffalo was fully grown, he was lifting one and a half tons, but he wasn't happy with that. He started practicing so he could lift the buffalo with one hand. Then he started juggling with it. <laughs> one night he took it down the pub, tied a bit of elastic to it, used it as a yo-yo. <laughs> Surprised the regulars. Two and a half tonne of buffalo flying backwards and forwards across the saloon bar. Its horns making track marks across the ceiling. Hooves ripping the cloth off the pool table. After a couple of hours, the elastic broke. The buffalo shot out through the pub doors at 50 miles an hour, landed on a skateboard, went careering down the high street, smashed through a chemist window and knocked over a display of Palma violets. And a bloke in the chemist shop said, that's unusual. <laughs> for a Wednesday. <laughs> I get a lot of visitors from outer space. <laughs> I had a blob come round the other week. Stood at me doorstep, it said, I come from a planet millions of years ahead of yours. I could show you a thousand things in the blink of an eye you'd never believe. Blimey, you got prisoners jumping out of your fridge. <laughs> <laughs> In the midst of life there is death, in the midst of death there is eternity. Bob Wyatt was a man who knew life and a man who loved life. I well remember the first time... <coughs> Peter Brundle <laughs> was a man who knew life and a man who loved life. I well remember. Audrey. <laughs> Douglas Murray was alive. <laughs> And now he isn't, <laughs> but we shall never forget him. He was a man who... <laughs> a, a, a man who distinguished himself in an area where it is never easy to be distinguished. <laughs> Amongst his many achievements was the ability to grow a black moustache with matching side And in his adult life, he was never less than six foot tall. He was a heavy man who wore glasses, a blue suit and a pork pie hat. We shall never see his like again. Welcome again to Paul Merton's Golden Years of Hollywood. 
<laughs> Tonight we take a look at the unsung heroes of Hollywood, the stuntmen. <laughs> Perhaps the greatest stuntman of them all was Dan O'Guts. <laughs> he went to Hollywood in 1931 and quickly established himself as the man who would do anything. Dan was famous for his stunts with horses. Here is a piece of rare footage that shows the highly developed understanding between man and beast. <laughs> oh, Guts was a fitness fanatic. His exercise program was carefully worked out with the help of the Canadian Air Force. Ready when you are! Right on, Mr. Old Guts. Oh. More, more! Call them bullets! <laughs> Dan was a tough man. He'd come from a tough neighborhood. Not surprising he'd become a stunt man when even a trip to the laundrette was fraught with danger. One's broken, dearie. <laughs> but sadly, the career of Dan O'Guts was brought to an untimely end after a stunt with a giant steam press went disastrously wrong. Here is a screen test he made for MGM in 1953. <laughs> and so, until the next time the usherette's torch lights our pathway to the stars, Goodbye. <laughs>